There's a popular myth about infinity, and that is that it's just like a really big, finite number. But travelling further and further down the number line, or counting to bigger and bigger finite numbers, gets you no nearer whatsoever to infinity. It's the wrong way to think about it. In fact, infinity exists between 0 and 1, because there's infinitely many fractions less than 1, a half, a third, a quarter, and so on, forever. Infinity isn't like a big, finite number. To deal with it, we have to step out of the realm of finite numbers altogether. The German mathematician David Hilbert gave a striking illustration of how weird the arithmetic of infinity can get. Imagine, he said, a hotel with infinitely many rooms. In an ordinary hotel, you can't squeeze more guests in once all the rooms are full. But Hilbert's Grand Hotel is different. If the guest in room 1 moves to room 2, the person in room 2 to room 3 and so on, all the way down the line, a newcomer can be placed in room 1. In fact, you can make space for infinitely many new clients by moving the occupants of rooms 1, 2, 3 and so on to rooms 2, 4, 6 and so on, freeing up all the odd-numbered rooms. The process can be continued indefinitely, so that even if an infinite number of coaches were to arrive, each carrying an infinite number of passengers, no one would have to be turned away. It's not an intuitive result, but we're not used to dealing with things that are infinitely large. In the case of Hilbert's Hotel, the statements, there's a guest to every room, and more guests can be accommodated, aren't mutually exclusive. In the late 19th century, mathematicians were faced with a crucial issue. Were they prepared to embrace infinity as a new kind of number? Most weren't. But a few, notably German mathematician George Cantor, recognized that the time had come to put the idea of infinite sets on a sound logical footing. In pioneering the realm of the infinite, Cantor faced fierce criticism from many of his contemporaries. He lost his job at the University of Berlin, and from time to time even his sanity. In later life he was in and out of mental institutions and became embroiled with the philosophical implications of his work. But although he died miserably in a sanatorium in 1918, he is now remembered for his fundamental contributions to set theory and our understanding of the infinite. Cantor realized that the well-known pairing off principle used to tell if two finite sets are equal could also be applied to infinite sets. It followed that there really are just as many even positive integers as there are integers altogether. Far from being a paradox, he realized, this was a defining property of infinite sets, that the whole is no bigger than the sum of its parts. He went on to show that the set of all natural numbers contains just as many members as the set of all rational numbers. He called this infinite set Aleph Null, Aleph being the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. You might think there could be only one infinite number, because once something is endlessly big, how could anything be bigger? But Cantor showed that there are different kinds of infinity, of which Aleph Null is the smallest. Infinitely bigger than Aleph Null is Aleph 1. Infinitely bigger again is Aleph 2, and so on. Alephs come in infinitely many sizes. Not only that, but corresponding to each Aleph, are infinitely many other infinite numbers, a fact that leads us to consider the difference in the realm of the infinite between cardinals and ordinals. Cardinal numbers tell us how many there are in a collection of things, 1, 5, 42, and so on, whereas ordinal numbers give the order or position of something, 1st, 5th, 42nd, and so on. The distinction between these two types of number doesn't seem important in the case of finite sets, Say we're talking about pencils. It's obvious that you can't have a fifth pencil without having at least five pencils in a group, and that you could still have a fifth pencil even if there were seven in a group. You could also have five pencils without having a fifth pencil if you didn't put them in any order. But we can use the same symbols for cardinals and ordinals, one or first, five or fifth, 42 or 42nd, and so on. Cantor realized, though, that when it comes to infinite numbers, the distinction becomes vitally important. To see this, we need to look at an area of maths that Cantor and another German mathematician, Richard Dedekind, were instrumental in developing, set theory. 
A set is a collection of things which might be numbers or anything else and the symbol used to show a set is a pair of curly brackets. For instance 1, 4, 9, 25 and arrow, bow, 75, R are both sets. The size of a set, how many elements it contains, is known as its cardinality. Both the sets just mentioned have four elements and so have a cardinality of four. If the cardinality of two sets is the same then every element in the first set can be paired off with one in the second so that nothing's left over. In other words they have a one-to-one -one correspondence. For example we can pair one with 75, four with arrow, nine with R and 25 with bow to show that these sets have the same cardinality. The finite cardinals, cardinals that measure the size of finite sets, are just the natural numbers 1, 2, 3 and so on. Sometimes we include 0 as well. The first infinite cardinal, aleph null, measures the size of the set of all natural numbers. For finite sets there's not much difference between the size of a set given by a cardinal number and its length given by an ordinal number. But in the case of infinite sets there's a big difference. To understand this we need to know about well-ordered sets. A set is well-ordered if it satisfies two conditions. First it has a definite first member and second each subset of its members also has a first member. The finite set 1, 2, 3 for instance is well-ordered. The set of all integers on the other hand which includes all negative whole numbers as well as all positive ones dot 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 minus 2 minus 1 0 1 2 dot 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 isn't well ordered because there's no first member. The set of all natural numbers, 1, 2, 3 and so on, is well ordered because despite having no specified member at the end, it has one at the start and every subset containing only natural numbers also has a first member. A key point is that well ordered infinite sets of the same size or cardinality can have different lengths. Strictly speaking we should say different ordinalities but talking about lengths helps to appreciate what's going on. Think about the sets 1, 2, 3, 4, dot, 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 and 1, 2, 4, dot, 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 3, where the three dots mean carry on forever. Both sets contain all the natural numbers and therefore have the same cardinality, aleph null, but the second is slightly longer. At first, this doesn't seem to make sense. After all, if we're talking about finite sets, then it's obvious that 1, 2, 3, 4, and 1, 2, 4, 3 are identical in length because they both contain four members. But infinite sets are counterintuitive. The set 1, 2, 3, 4, dot, dot, dot has no finite n member because the three dots tell you to carry on forever without stopping. However, 1, 2, 4, dot, 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 3 is different. It also contains a sequence of members that carries on forever, but it contains one member that's beyond all the members of the never-ending sequence. With the 3 taken out, the sequence 1, 2, 3, dot, dot, dot is just as long as 1, 2, 4, dot, dot, dot. In other words, you could pair off all the members of these two sequences and never have one left over. But moving the 3 to the end so that it comes after the infinite sequence adds 1 to the length. We need a naming system for this class of infinite numbers which is different than the Alephs. Mathematicians call the smallest infinite ordinal the shortest length of the set of all natural numbers, omega. The ordinality of the set 1, 2, 4, dot, 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 3, where the 3 is placed after all the other natural numbers, is 1 greater, namely omega plus 1. The plus sign here is a bit confusing because it doesn't mean addition in the usual sense, but rather that omega plus 1 is the next ordinal after omega. Aleph null and omega both refer to the same set, the set of natural numbers. Aleph null is its size, how many elements it contains, and omega is its shortest length. This length can be increased by taking elements out of their usual order and placing them at the end. The set 345 dot 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 1 2 for instance has a cardinality of aleph null but an ordinality of omega plus 2. We can keep on increasing the length of the set of natural numbers by moving more and more elements beyond the three dots that mean carry on forever. Omega plus 3, omega plus 4, all the way up to omega plus omega or omega times 2, which could be written, for instance, as the subset of all even numbers followed by the subset of all odd numbers. 2, 4, dot, 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 1, 3, 5, dot, 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 since each of these is equal in length to omega. Then we can continue as before by shifting elements to the end. 
we can move on to powers of omega such as omega squared omega cubed and so on all the way up to omega to the power of omega and then to stacks of powers power towers of omega stretching higher and higher until we reach a power tower of omegas that's omega high finally beyond this lies a new level an ordinal that Cantor called epsilon zero just as omega is the smallest ordinal that lies beyond the finite ordinals epsilon zero is the smallest ordinal that lies beyond any ordinal that can be expressed in terms of omega using addition multiplication and exponentiation it's the gateway to the realm of epsilon numbers which like that of the omega ordinals is infinitely large the whole process described for the omegas repeats for the epsilons until all the mathematical operations that are possible using epsilons are exhausted. At this point we arrive at yet another level of infinite ordinals starting with zeta zero and so it goes on. More than anything the difficulty in progressing further is notation. Eventually all the Greek letters are exhausted along with any other ordinary labeling system to represent the hierarchy of infinite ordinals. Compounded with the problem of finding more powerful and compact means of notating vast infinite ordinals is a mounting degree of technical difficulty. Some milestones named after the mathematicians with whose work they're associated lie along the way, once zeta zero has been left far behind. The Pfefferman Schutt ordinal, the small and large Veblen ordinals, the Bachman Howard ordinal, and the Church Clean ordinal first described by American mathematician Alonzo Church and his student Stephen Clean. The Church Clean ordinal is so incomprehensibly vast that there's no notation whatsoever that can reach up to it. These ordinals may be mind-bogglingly huge but the point is they're countable. In other words all the infinite ordinals we've talked about so far starting with Omega can be paired off one-to-one -one with the natural numbers. They all correspond to the cardinality aleph null. We're no nearer to a bigger kind of infinity when we get to epsilon zero or even the church clean ordinal than when we started. They're just different ways of ordering the set of all natural numbers. A bigger kind of infinity means one that transcends aleph null altogether. But how's that possible? Aleph null doesn't behave like the numbers we're used to. Whereas 1 plus 1 equals 2, aleph null plus 1 is still aleph null. Aleph null plus any finite number is still aleph null. You can't make aleph null bigger by adding to it or multiplying it by any finite number or even multiplying it by itself. But Cantor showed using a theorem that's now named after him that there's a hierarchy of infinities of which aleph null is the smallest. The next infinite cardinal, aleph 1, is much bigger and is equal in size to the set of all countable ordinals. Because the natural numbers are countable, aleph null, the size of the set of natural numbers, is said to be a countably infinite cardinal. Corresponding with it is the smallest infinite countable ordinal, omega, and infinitely many other countably infinite ordinals. All of these infinitely many countable ordinals arise because in the case of ordinals, information on order matters so that a much finer distinction has to be made than with cardinals. Even so, all the countable ordinals from omega onwards fall within the same cardinality, aleph null. But with aleph 1 comes a dramatic change. Not only is aleph 1 indescribably larger than aleph null, but it's also uncountable. Corresponding to it is the smallest uncountable ordinal, omega 1. We've said that aleph 1 is the size of the set of countable ordinals, but does it have any other interpretation? Aleph null measures the size of the set of all natural numbers. Does aleph 1 also correspond with anything that's familiar and conceptually easy to grasp? Cantor thought so. He believed that aleph 1 was identical with the total number of points on a mathematical line, which astonishingly he found was the same as the number of points on a plane or in any higher n-dimensional space. This infinity of spatial points, known as the power of the continuum, C, is also the set of all real numbers. Cantor's continuum hypothesis asserts that C equals aleph 1, which is equivalent to saying that there's no infinite set with a cardinality between that of the natural numbers and that of the real numbers. Yet Cantor was never able to prove or disprove his continuum hypothesis. We now know why and it strikes to the very foundations of mathematics. 
In the 1930s, Austrian-born logician Kurt Gödel showed that it's impossible to prove the continuum hypothesis is wrong, starting from the standard axioms of set theory. Three decades later, American mathematician Paul Cohen showed that neither can it be proved correct from those same axioms. In other words, its status was indeterminate within the normal framework that mathematicians used. Such a situation had been on the cards ever since the emergence of a theorem discovered by Gödel called the incompleteness theorem. But the independence of the continuum hypothesis was unsettling because it was the first example of an important question that provably couldn't be decided either way from the universally accepted system of axioms on which most of mathematics is built. The debate about whether the continuum hypothesis is ultimately true or not rumbles on. As for the nature of the various types of infinities and the very existence of infinite sets, these depend on what number theory is being used. Different axioms and rules lead to different answers to the question, what lies beyond all the integers? This can make it difficult or even meaningless to compare the various types of infinities and to determine their relative size, although within any given number system the infinities can usually be put into a clear order. There's a towering hierarchy of cardinals beyond Aleph Null. Assuming the continuum hypothesis to be true, the next cardinal is Aleph 1, equal to the size of the set of all real numbers. After this comes Aleph 2, then Aleph 3, and so on without end. To each Aleph corresponds an infinite number of ordinals, the smallest of which is Omega in the case of Aleph Null, Omega 1 in the case of Aleph 1, and so on. Even though there are infinitely many Alephs, each infinitely bigger than the one before, mathematicians can dream of cardinals whose size exceeds that of any conceivable Aleph. To do this, they have to move beyond the usual foundations of their subject and resort to what are called forcing axioms. This leads to the concept of large cardinals, which in reality are spectacularly vast, including those with special names such as Marlow cardinals and supercompact cardinals. Finally, there's the notion of absolute infinity, sometimes represented by capital Omega, an infinity that transcends or surpasses all others. Cantor himself spoke about it, but mainly in the form of metaphysical speculation. Sticking purely to maths, absolute infinity can't be defined rigorously, so mathematicians tend to ignore it. It's tempting to characterize it as the number of elements in the universe of all sets, the so-called von Neumann universe. But the von Neumann universe isn't a set, it's actually a class of sets, so it can't be used to define any specific kind of infinity. The quest for Omega will continue to challenge future generations of mathematicians and philosophers. Meanwhile, we have plenty of infinities, each infinitely larger than the one before, to keep our brains occupied.